Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Moving Forward. Tonight, it will be a program with a difference because we are confronted with a serious issue that has, spoke, that has been spoken about with a passion, but nothing, simply nothing, is being done about it. Therefore, I make no apologies for taking the stand that I'm doing tonight because time is not on our side. So tonight I want to put into perspective the dangers we all face with global warming and climate change that is beginning to show itself in a big way. The question we now have to consider is whether it is now too late. I want to point out to you that the UN General Secretary is himself staggered that on the 21st and 22nd of July, 2024, the world had the hottest two days ever, and some people died from heat exhaustion, and it may be getting worse. The talking is now over, and action, serious action, must be taken. It might even be too late. We have tried to do without fossil fuel, one way or the other. And before I continue this subject, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty One, we come to you to ask for your protection as the earth begins to heat up. O oh, Father, put some sense into the minds of the leaders of the world. Even in the Eastern Caribbean, we have heard leaders like Mia Motley, Ralph Gonzalez, and Philip Joseph Pierre plead into the bigger countries to help fight the scourge of climatic conditions that might destroy us all. Father, please enter into their hearts and minds and let the fight be of safe and to the planet, to save the planet on earth. I therefore hope and pray that common sense will prevail and urgent action will be taken to try and pull back from the brink. I put my faith and trust in you because you are the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Tonight I quote from Shirak, chapter 5, verses 11 to 15, and chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Be certain about what you believe, and consistent in what you say. Don't try to please everyone or agree with everything people say. Always be ready to listen, but take your time in answering. Answer only if you know what to say. Keep quiet. Speaking can bring you either honor or disgrace. What you say can ruin you. Don't get a reputation for being a gossip. And don't tell tales that will hurt people. Just as robbers will suffer disgrace, so liars will suffer condemnation. Or one would say severe condemnation. Do nothing destructive, whether it seems insignificant or not. And do not be an enemy when you should be a friend. A bad reputation brings you the disgrace that lying sinners deserve. Do not let your passions carry you away. This can tear your soul to pieces like a bull. You will be left like a dead tree without any leaves or fruits. Evil desires will destroy you and make you a joke to your enemies. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I now return to my opening salvo on global warming and climate change. The bigger countries of the world who could have done something about over 20 years ago, they just talk about it and continue to pollute in order to enrich themselves, knowing full well that there will be a price to pay. And now the chickens per se are coming home to roost. Over the years, as I mentioned in my prayers, in the Caribbean, the leaders we have heard speaking passionately about this subject, in my view, is Mia Motley of Barbados, Ralph Gonzalez of St. Vincent, and Philip Joseph Pierre of St. Lucia. They have vehemently spoken with a passion at the United Nations and made it clear to the developed world leaders that we can't wait no longer for putting things in place to combat global warming and climate change as urgently as possible. I believe if the weather we are seeing at present all over the world does not bring top scientists in the world to their senses 
as to what is happening, then they simply don't care about the future generations to come. Their policy, in my view, is simply, let us live for now, and the future generation will look after themselves. However, the climate change that is taking place at this juncture of our lives will very well wipe them out sooner than they thought. Despite growing scientific evidence of a warming world, greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. And the United Nations talks aimed at doing something about it are moving at a glacial pace. Therefore, over the last year or so, it has been most gratifying to finally observe that Caribbean governments are realizing that we as a people are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today and that we are suddenly being confronted with the fierce urgency of now. Before elucidating further, my worry is whether those governments in terms of global warming and climate change may not have realized that their action and efforts may be too late or too little. In this un unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination, I've been told, is, a, is still the thief of time. We're seeing in governments, after so many years of procrastination and a dithering policy on climate change, are suddenly waking up to the reality that global warming and climate change is with us. It is not only a threat to the developed world, but to all humanity, especially small island states like the Caribbean islands, who like the sleeping volcano are now beginning to make some noise by sending a message to the developed nations. They are making it clear that they are not prepared to be pushed around according to their whims and fancies of their dictate when they are the main culprits in the conundrum of global warming and climate change. In my view, it is not enough to talk big, but to act big. What has amazed me is that during the days when the Caribbean islands were struggling to remove the yoke of colonialism that existed in a big way, there was then a kind of pre-existent unity of purpose that kept things moving in one solid direction. However, on achieving that independence, so-called independence, all the grim problems of life confronted the region with stark realism. The lack of capital, the strangulating poverty, the uncontrollable birth rates, and above all, the high aspiration level of our people. In theory, the post-colonial period is now more difficult and pre precarious than the colonial struggle itself. Emancipation, my foot. In my view, Caribbean governments have only re recently jumped on the global warming and climate change bandwagon to the extent that they threatened to walk out at the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, which gathered in Peru during December 2014. If mentioned, is not made on the allocation of funds to small island states who are most threatened in terms of global warming and climate change. They are the ones, not the big ones. Once again, we are confronted with the problem of too little too late. What is intriguing for years is that advocates like me and others who have been calling for action to mitigate the effects of climate change and its impacts on small island states and have been ignored because we were the little voices in the wilderness. Even though, in my case, I hold a degree in environmental and resource management. Many Caribbean governments then were so besotted by their political power and self-aggrandizement that they ignored our pleas as there was little concern for the environment in terms of climate change. Even today, as I speak, there's very little legislation to curb some of the blatant pollution that has taken place by the populace. The only way those Caribbean governments will demonstrate that they mean business is when they are tough-minded enough to put measures in place to punish those who keep polluting the environment willfully. Some governments, even aided and abetted, are continually 
desecrating the environment as long as it benefits their political aspiration. The list of violators are huge in terms of hotel building, the cutting down of trees for farming, the blatant disregard for building on slope land areas. The list goes on. Some laws were enacted for the purpose of prosecuting, but was never really implemented. And therefore, the deforestation and pollution that has taken place is unprecedented. And much was done with government's blessings. In St. Lucia, for instance, the main harbor in which the magnificent and superb tourist ships are coming in to birth is one of the most polluted estuary in the world. And in theory, it's a death trap. Should we try or the unfortunate person to fall into that water. What grieves me is that, as a boy, the area was a favorite place for young boys or girls to learn to swim. The pollution that is now part and parcel of this estuary did not happen overnight, but was a gradual process, which was simply ignored because governments were unconcerned due to their short-sightedness then as to the dangers of pollution and its effects. Today, with the advent of the seriousness that Caribbean economies have faced, with more so as many are floundering towards abject poverty, they are now beginning to see the seriousness of global warming and climate change. The simple truth is that they need money under the climatic change banner to help them mitigate the seriousness of the economic situation and is now unfolded and which took place under their watch. Even though the magnitude of global warming and climate change is there for all to see, there is still mistrust between rich and poor nations. Arguments about who is historically responsible for global warming and fears about the impact of cutting emissions, mainly from burning fossil fuels. On the economic growth, there was among, there was among the fact, factors breaking action on climate change and the increase in floods, heat waves, droughts, crop failures, and rising sea level that scientists say it will bring, it will bring and is beginning to do so. Many of us sit back and pretend it is not happening because the effect of climate change is a phenomenon that is gradually creeping on Caribbean states like an amoeba. Therefore, let us not be fooled, ladies and gentlemen, by some of the hollow noises that are being echoed because Caribbean governments first showed their insincerity when they started talking about seeking means and ways of looking for reparations from countries like Great Britain and others for the for the ignominy of the slave trade. Now suddenly they are jumping on the bandwagon of climate change because they are of the view that an injection of money to combat climate change will be given by the United Nations to the islands. If much noise and threats are made, so they think. That is why threats of walking out during the UNCCC conference in Peru in December 2014 was being heard if their demands are not met. However, much of their threats sounded somewhat hollow, as I said before, and without substance because they were simply devoid of ideas. In my view, if Caribbean governments are serious, then they must even now show their determination to contribute meaningfully on mitigating the effects of global warming and climate change. It's a disjuncture. I'll take my first break. I'll be back. I am getting heated up. Welcome back to Moving Forward. And I was talking about 
global warming and climate change. Therefore, I am of the view that our cries will fail on their affairs if we are not persistent. The proverbial legacy of procrastination left behind after the regions got their independence or so-called independence has now afflicted them once again. Those who now holler for help to combat climate change once again is being asked one fundamental question as to what have they done to cushion the impact and seriousness of global warming and climate change in their country. It is true to say that some have tinkered at doing something, but not sufficient to ameliorate the situation. In St. Lucia, we have heard noises being made and what the country is doing to combat climate change. But somehow, the messengers don't seem genuine, nor are they sufficiently versed in the subject because they are simply the proverb proverbial square pegs in round holes. My question to them is simply this. What have they done in the last three years or five years to foster the dangers of climate change and global warming? What is important for them to note is that anthropogenic climate change has become a major threat to countries around the world. Based on scientific findings and observations and the recently published fifth assessment report of the intergovernmental sorry, panel on climate change, which is IPCC, clearly indicated that our climate system is warming with increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, declining snow and ice, rising sea level, and higher overall temperatures in the atmosphere. We have seen it, as I said last week, 21st and 22nd of July. According to the AR5 report, it is evident that human activity has had a profound impact on our climate system and that this impact has grown since the release of the AR4 report. The new report emphasizes the need for substantial and sustained GHG emissions reductions in order to combat climate change. It is therefore clear that even with an immediate halt of GHG emissions, climate change will last for many centuries. Therefore, long-term commitment is required to deal with the challenges posed by climate change. I remember the then Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Miss Christiana Figures, remarked that AR5 leaves no room for doubt with regard to the severity of climate change and that no country is immune to its impact. Many Caribbean countries are prone to climate change because some are in low-lying areas and are therefore at the mercy of the weather. And any significantly sea level rising can wipe out some towns and villages in that hemisphere. So far, the present hurricane season has sped the islands, although there are still some weeks to go before the real season began, although we have seen one already. We must be thankful to the Almighty. There is no doubt in my mind that the world is imminent, is in imminent peril. And nothing would quench my resolve to spread the message of global warming and climate change. And that is what I'm doing tonight. It is a debt we owe to our children and grandchildren. In my view, the Kyoto Climate Treaty was simply weak tea and did not work. It must be remembered to those who know that the United States did not sign Kyoto, yet its emissions are not that different from the countries that did sign it. Many of the bigger nations are of the view that only a carbon tax agreed by the West and then imposed on the rest of the world through political pressure and trade tariffs would succeed in 
the now desperate task of stopping the rise of emissions. This tax would be imposed on oil corporations and gas companies and would specifically raise the prices of fuel across the globe, making their use less attractive. In addition, the mining of coal, by far the worst emitter of carbon dioxide, would be phased out. And we have seen that in England, for example. It would be phased out entirely along with coal burning. But even in St. Lucia, we've seen that too. Power plants, which are seen as factories of death. However, the view of smaller countries are clear. Why should they have to agree to higher taxes when the beneficiaries of the economic expansion that has taken place are from the developed countries of the world. They are agreed that in the present situation that the developed countries should foot the bill of carbon reduction. They may have a point in that climato climatologists have claimed that per capita Britain is responsible for more of the carbon dioxide now in the atmosphere than any other nation on earth. I hope the British listen to this because it has now been burning it from the dawn of industrial revolution. America comes second, Germany third. The world has to be cognizant that warnings of climate change concentrates heavily on global warming impacts on the ice caps in Greenland and the Antarctica. There are now, they are now, these are now melting at an alarming rate and threaten to increase sea levels by one to two meters over the century, enough to inundate cities and fertile land around the globe. What we have to consider in the Caribbean is that the devastating impact it will have on our coastal villages and even the bigger towns will not be spared as some are below sea level. Although the doomsday scenario can be avoided, if every country, large or small, plays its part in bringing about an awareness of the impact of the twin enemies to Mother Earth at present, global warming and climate change. Therefore, no one can afford to procrastinate any longer. And the sensitization process must begin with earnest, in earnest, with laws and regulations that are enforced religiously. That is the message that should have gone out to the UNFCCC conference in Peru in 2014. Not threats. There must be awareness by all nations that we cannot punish our wildlife indiscriminately and an understanding of the fragility of nature's food chain. However, is the environment really in better shape today? Have we saved the planet or is it in greater peril than ever? I say it is. As the world warms, sea levels rise and coral reefs crumble to coral bleaching. These questions have acquired a new and urgent relevance. We have seen it ourselves in Little St. Lucia. The planet is in far worse state today than it was in the 60s. The populations have risen from 3.1 million to nearly 8 billion. Sorry, 3.1 billion to nearly 8 billion. And rising seas are being drained of fish, wild places destroyed, and wildlife devastated. The important message that should resonate wrong is that everything in nature is related to everything else. Yet we have not taken that idea on board or fully appreciated significance. Those of us who care must raise awareness about humanity's potential to wreak havoc with nature. However, we must never forget that nature has a way of hitting back. As we are seeing right now. Especially in the last 10 years. And its effect will continue for many years to come. As I mentioned in the opening salvo. That in 
the last week we have been seeing temperatures to the highest level ever and the heat was uncomfortable for many in the world. We have been warned it is now for the world leaders to pull their finger out and do what is necessary to save planet Earth. This is simply intriguing to me. And what is simply intriguing to me is that we have an independent country who is not part of the United Nations because of the one thing or another. Yet this country I'm speaking about is more concerned than those who sit and vote in that sacred chamber we call the United Nations. Taiwan has carried out every recommended advice from that body of distinguished men and women to deal with global warming and climate change from that body of men and women. When we therefore talk about global warming and climate change, Taiwan, who, as I mentioned, is not part of the UN, has spent millions in trying to do everything recommended and that which is possible to reduce emissions and abide by UN mandates. Yet lots of members of the United Nations seem to just talk and talk until the cows come home, adding to nothing. They are simply a joke because for not recognizing Taiwan because of China, China's one policy and one of the biggest polluters in the world at present. And in a sense, they are now suffering harshly from the severe weather patterns we are seeing all over the world. The question that I now want to ask is whether the UN will continue their charade of not giving Taiwan a seat at the United Nations because of the one China policy that is, in my view, a simple farce. Now back to the home front. And before I even go into it, I will take my next break and I'll be back. The home front is very important right now. Welcome back to Moving Forward. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are back on the home front. I want to make a statement that may leave many of you floundering in that I say this openly, that we must make use of the help that we are given by our diplomatic friends, more so the Taiwanese. Others have given us tremendous help, but Taiwan has always been by our side in terms of giving financial support when we need it. The important thing as far as I'm concerned is that we must make every effort to make use of that help we are given. So I say once again loud and clear that our government, whenever the instances arise to defend as much as they can, in that it is without a doubt a developing democracy of 24 million people. They must defend them. We are one of the most progressive people. They are one of the most progressive people in the world, regardless of their politeness. And also many are very industrious and entrepreneurial. And ladies and gentlemen, young boys and young girls, we must do all we can to emulate the Taiwanese. However, as I've said before, we must make it clear to the United Nations and other countries of the world that Taiwan is a democracy and it is not part of China. In one of the books that I'm trying to complete on that subject, I have made it clear in the title of the book that the democratization of Taiwan is an impediment to a one China principle. This I believe with a passion because the CCP has never ruled Taiwan. Not only that, 
But Taiwan is a self-governing country with its own government system that is on par to the best in the world. Without a doubt, fully democratic. And it's not a piecemeal democracy. After the Portuguese called it, when they passed, Yila Formosa, that beautiful country, on their passage close to Taiwan. It was the Dutch who came and ruled Taiwan to begin with. And we know that Japan ruled the island for 50 years and was about to become, they were about to become part of China, Japan, sorry, before the Second World War. So I now said to the Prime Minister, let us make it easy for the Taiwanese entrepreneurs to come and invest in St. Lucia. Let us have an education system that is jointly run with Taiwan. We have seen some of the results of that in the Mandarin teaching in St. Lucia. What we did, what we did now, or what we need now is Taiwan to bring some world technology to this country and to make Sir Arthur Lewis a joint university with Taiwan, with the students coming here and St. Lucians going there. A joint degree program can now be worked out by the two countries. I would love to see this happen in my lifetime. And the opportunities are there, ladies and gentlemen. On another subject, because I have so much more to say about the joint cooperation and working between the two countries, I leave it for another show. Just before I get into the nitty gritty of the other part of my program, I want to say how shocked I was to have read one of the comments from an individual who seemed to be somewhat unaware of what they were writing or seemed to be totally dishonest in their complaint. It was so I was somewhat flabbergasted when the individual had the audacity to write on the last moving forward program. And I quote, stop that nonsense about the vaccines. It has become irrit irritable because I keep repeating it until the fact that the country was conned. And I make no apologies. I will continue until we can get our monies back in terms of the $7.3 million that we paid for vaccines we never received. What is unacceptable is that the individual concerned did not deal in vaccines, etc. Not only that, but it was in the manner that $7.3 million was handed to the individual. However, the individual in the comments section went on to say that PIP, which is Philip, knows about the vaccines. Ask him. It seems as if the individual is making the play that the present prime minister knew because he was involved. This is without a doubt sheer lunacy and total bullshit. This individual seemed to have forgotten that their government then did not discuss anything of that nature with the leader of the opposition, who was then Philip. Don't forget, as alleged, that the past prime minister broke all the finance rules dealing with the signing of the check he gave to the individual. As well, I will continue to harp on that piece of alleged corruption until the cows come home. And more so, now I know it is beginning to upset the mendicants the last prime minister usually spoke about when in office. I will continue until we can hear or we can get our monies back. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say something that will touch every sinew in your bodies because there is a truism about it. And that is, in my short life, and I mean that in sincerity, because whether you live for a hundred years, it is still a short time in this life or world that we exist. However, I want to point out that in a short space of time, I've encountered, encountered three people that seem to have become a nightmare in my life 
as far as lying is concerned. The question is, who are these individuals? And why do I have such a disdain for these individuals? Well, without a doubt, they have led many of their countrymen and women astray because they are the three biggest liars that I have ever encountered. And they are ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson of England, ex-President Donald Trump of the United States, and the ex-Prime Minister Alan Shastny of St. Lucia. I make this assessment without flinching an eyelid. However, there are others like Xi Jinping of China, Maduro of Venezuela, Putin of Russia, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, an ex-president of Sri Lanka, and others who have lied basically to get into power. It seems as if it has become a trait worldwide. So far, I pray and hope that our present prime minister is doing all he can to fulfill the promises he made before the election. I personally will hold him accountable should he go astray without solid reasons to do so. For example, a terrible hurricane or some health issues such as COVID-19, etc. There will be reasons. Here is Alan in 217 saying, as I thought then, truthfully and sincerely, that it will take him three years to put St. Lucia on sound footing in different ministries. Yet the same individual, when I'm talking about lies, in 2021, before the election, says that he would need 10 years <laughs> to do what he had promised in three years. Yet he simply forgot that he was in power for nearly five and a half years and simply achieved nothing but breaking down buildings. One was to accommodate maybe his family, I don't know, in rent from the government of the day for years to come. Many in this country are all uh, <laughs> allegedly making that statement without any hesitation. Therefore, he is all right, Jack and really does not care about the little man in the country. He simply does not care about the homeless or those in poverty or the children who need proper schooling at a very young age. Nor does he care about the health service he decimated. Oh, before I even go any further, when I mention about the $7.3 million dollars, they are simply, they, it was simply handed over to friends. This person writing a comment that made that nonsensical point, as I mentioned, that Philip knew all about this, as though he was with Alan when he made the decision. It just shows you that vile minds, that some are demented people in this country, have flown in their veins. Well, once again, Marcus Garvey and later Bob Marley, were like prophets to the black man in the Caribbean when they advised us that we must learn to release ourselves from mental slavery. When Alan left government as prime minister, the majority of ministries were in disarray for workers and permanent secretaries that in my view were useless and worthless. But they had jobs and positions because they knew how to kiss ass. We see it today in the poor service that these nincompoops give to the public. And I said this with all sincerity. And we must work very hard to put at least three of these ministries back into proper work in order. There is no doubt of this because of all the good work that has been done elsewhere will be undone, even though there is a competent minister. Much of what I have observed in commerce, it's piecemeal because leadership is very poor. Not the minister, but the leadership from permanent secretary. I don't say this out of malice because I always believe that at times some may feel hurt by the truth. I care not about commerce, but about all the ministries because if they are working efficiently and effectively, then the future is bright. The lackadaisical ways of working under the last government is still embedded in those still there, more so the permanent secretary and others. We see things 
that should be done correctly are done in a haphazard manner because some use the ministry as if it is their own. That cannot be. When you are given public, when you are given public service to the nation, at this juncture, I want to say quite categorically that I raise my heart and my hat to Philip Joseph Pierre, our Prime Minister, for the way he has commanded his ship of state. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll take a break and I'll be back. Welcome back to Moving Forward. Ladies and gentlemen, I was talking about Philip Joseph Pierre. He has taken a country that was literally in shambles, which the last government had left behind. And within three years, his government has put much back together, which many had not contemplated. On the 26th of July, we celebrated three years of this government taking over and now, as the fourth year has begun, I can assure you, my countrymen and women, if we are spared by nature, then we will see movement in all directions in the development of the country. There is no doubt that I will want to be part of that development because I still have young children and want to leave behind a country that they can be proud of because of a government that put people first. That is something the United Records of the Poor cannot understand because they were fed on the idea of looking after family, friends, and certain foreigners. The last government was not about governing because they were so short-sighted. When I look back at the last prime minister, all I can see is a con merchant who muddles his way through because of his incompetence. His human stupidity has no bonds, yet he has a few idiots following him and i'm convinced that it has to do with his skin tone without a doubt many simply analyze or try to break down what he's exposing not realizing that all he spews out is a form of garbage unheard of and a stench that is hard to stomach ladies and gentlemen i want to say it to you quite categorically that i hate no one but only to speak honestly. But in speaking about the last Prime Minister, I don't see much good that I can write of his running of this country. What grieves me is that Alan lies even when he denies he lied. There is, in my view, arrogance about him and those lies. What this guy failed to realize is that during his time as Prime Minister, what was clearly there is that the poor was getting poorer and the few rich people were becoming richer. You can look around you in Soufre, Denry, Castries, Miko, Grosile. This dis disparity of wealth could easily be seen in places like Ciceron, Castries East, and even Barbono, and Canaries, and Ancelere, Beaufort. It is difficult to analyze. Whatever is said about the individual, I go back into my think tank and come up with the idea that this individual never earned his place in the world. He was without a doubt an opportunistic liar and in essence suffered from the moral, from moral, mo moral bankruptcy. He rewarded ignorance and hubris. If one can be honest, there's no doubt in my mind that he was a self-serving parasite especially in knocking down buildings to help his friends and family have their share while something is being built and have to find a place for a building knocked down and need space to rent. We then all know the answer to that. 
I stand on the highest mountains in St. Lucia, and that is Mount Jimmy, and I say aloud that the last Prime Minister never really invested in our children, more so school children. We forget the laptop, do we? Their future was simply not important to him. We have been suffering from a shortage of teachers. He also did not care about the nursing profession because many of our nurses were leaving because of the way they were treated and the pay they got. Not only that, but he had a string of his people running the shop, so to speak, in the so-called health service. I'm not making this up because the facts are there to be seen. Only his supporters will tell you otherwise. I don't want anyone, more so his supporters, to forget that this individual was born into wealth. Therefore, he wanted to associate with the wealthy people. Don't forget that when he was introducing DSH to the public with his honored guest at his side, he felt so proud when he mentioned that he was bringing the sport of kings to St. Lucia. I've mentioned that before. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, I personally don't want you to forget that when he was given his tax bricks, whom did he give it to? It was to his rich friend. And that was over 20 odd million dollars that his rich friend owed this country. That was the country's money. A sum that could have done so much for the poor in the country. Can you imagine how this would improve so many poor people's lives? Oh no, he did not care about them. Just his friend or friends. I don't want the supporters of the United Records of the Poor to ever forget that. I say quite eloquently and to be categorical in what I now say. I'm convinced and was of the opinion that anything worthwhile that was good about this country would be passed over to his foreign friends because if we notice how he was destroying the country and in the end, in my view, it would become scrap to be sold to the highest bidder. He perpetuated a sort of fear mongering and resentment because he was a form of a dangerous pollutant and therefore was unfit for office. What amazed me with the supporters of the United Records of the Poor, they seem encouraged by lies that Alan fed them because the bigger the lie, the bigger applause he would get from them. Ladies and gentlemen, I say to you tonight that there will be difficulties that this government will have to overcome. But we have got to learn to be patient. Why? Because in three years, they have done so much after the awful mess that was left behind by the last inept government who mismanaged the economy to their heart's content as long as their FFF was satisfied with the spoils that were given to them. My fellow countrymen and women, I say this to you in all sincerity, that we must decolonize our minds because even as I put this program together, we have just celebrated the so-called Emancipation Day. Well, I don't see any emancipation that is worth celebrating because our minds are still consumed by the colonial ide ide ideals that were left behind. It is obvious by the way we treat the so-called whites who come to this country. Brothers and sisters, we must come to the point where we realize our potential and it is a vast one. What I can see at times is that we have to develop the potential that is there. Therefore, it's a form of law, self-esteem. What I find difficult to tolerate is we not putting this into ourselves. Why? Because many of this country seem to like to criticize. And we are seeing this being done openly by the opposition, the United Records of the Poor, because they failed the country and the people miserably when they were given a chance to govern the country. They are, in my view, failures because their leader and others did not have the leadership skills that were needed. They did not have it. Their leader did not realize that in order to build capacity, it has to be through cooperation and therefore this was not forthcoming 
in the then government. They did not make any effort to discuss certain issues with the then opposition because they had a high and mighty attitude about themselves. Now today in opposition, they want to be consulted or want to criticize the government on all the good things they are doing or putting in place. I say to the government to continue their good work and ignore what is termed an opposition. These are the same people who castigated the government when they built a jetty for fishermen in Miku North, which was needed and necessary by the fishermen in that region. Did they not call it a latrine or something like that? Words to that effect. Therefore, I say to the government to just get on with what has to be done. Because there is a proverb in life which clearly says that barking dogs seldom bite. Before I end once again, I say with a sincerity that engulfs me that the last prime minister was a liar. One of the biggest that I've ever come across. Now, as I mentioned before, he's one of the three biggest liars in the world. He's without a doubt pathological. Now, what do we see in this, in his opposition to the government? He's always trying to smack. He always brings out a smear campaign. They seem to give no proper advice or discuss intelligently what needs to be done because they are simply unable to do so. All they, can, all they care about is to do nothing but spread lies about everything. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about crime and try to make it look as if this government is inefficient in dealing with crime, I want to say that this government, present government, has put 10 times more money into fighting crime than the last government ever did. As I've mentioned before, some instances of law breaking was clearly done by the last government. In my view, they violated the law. And the last prime minister, in my view, this is the legacy he's leaving behind as the prime minister of St. Lucia. I therefore say to St. Lucians, if you are serious about the development of this country, we should say to this individual once bitten, twice shy, you'll never be prime minister of this country ever again, that you, do, you did nothing but a continual smear campaign at present at this government and it's hard working in improving the livelihood of people which you never did as prime minister. I therefore say to you, the people of this country, my brothers and sisters, what we have now to care about is simply to have a good life, to have our liberty within the laws of the country and without a doubt, the pursuit of happiness. And if we are to have all of this, we have to liberate ourselves from people like the leader of the opposition and his band of mendicants that follow him. In effect, a band of jackasses, as he calls them, or barking dogs. Ah, well, we live and learn. Once again, I close, ladies and gentlemen. I say to you, as clearly as I can, our future is in our hands, and therefore, we must do what we can to help this government build instead of destroy in order to benefit certain elitists in the country. That's what we saw. And we all know whom I'm talking about. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it deals with rents and more rents, which government has to pay and that drains the system. Once again, I say to you all that if we want to develop St. Lucia under Philip Joseph Pierre, we must teach and preach until the very foundation of our society is shaken. Therefore, we must work unceasingly to lift this lovely country we so love to a higher destiny, to a newer plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humanness. Ladies and gentlemen, listening tonight, I have tried to be honest and to do so is to confront the truth, however unpleasant and inconvenient the truth may be. I believe that we must expose and face it if we are to achieve a better quality of life for all St. Lucians, rich or poor. All we need in this country of ours is good health, education for our children, and jobs or employment to secure their future. I hope that all this will be achieved under Philip Joseph Pierre, a humble and decent individual who believes in the people and is prepared to fight for the people. My brothers and sisters, I therefore say to you tonight to go in peace. 
to serve the one most high. But we must never forget that we are black and should be proud of that. Therefore, again, go in peace to serve the one most high. Ladies and gentlemen, I say to you, good night, good night, and goodbye until next Sunday. God bless you all.